Hi, everyone. And as you can see, I've got my wonderful friend Stuart Goodyear with me. And Stuart is going to make his first appearance with the Reading Symphony Orchestra. As I say, Stuart is a great friend. We've worked together lots of times before. We've recorded, we've recorded all of the Beethoven piano concertos. And you good people could do a lot worse than buy this fabulous set with Stuart's lovely face on there and uh, yours truly waving the stick. I felt very privileged to be allowed to do that, Stuart. But welcome today, and we're looking forward to seeing you with the Reading Symphony. Absolutely. Now, Stuart, you are something of an expert with Beethoven, as I'm trying to point out, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But perhaps you could let the folks of Reading know a little bit about your background. So I was born and raised in Toronto, and I had a love for music since I was around three years old, and I heard uh, two record sets, one of Tchaikovsky and one of Beethoven, the complete symphonies of both composers. And I was listening to that on my, um, on my Mickey Mouse record player. And I was just, um, previously I was hearing, um, uh, rummaging through my dad's record collection. I never knew my dad. He died um, a month before I was born of cancer. Mm -hmm. So but, um, his legacy was this um, very extensive um, record collection that had um, classical, it had rock and roll, Led Zeppelin, Cat Stevens, Joe Cocker. So I was listening to that. That was my childhood um, soundtrack, as well as Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. But somehow those two composers um, moved me deeper than um, any other music. And I just love the fact that every kind of emotion was expressed and there was no limit to um, the duration. I didn't know they were called movements. I was still calling them tracks. And then it was um, that important year that I decided that I wanted to immerse myself in that sound world and uh, become a classical musician. And my journey began from there. Right, and you're very familiar with the, with the Reading area, you might say, because you studied just up the road in Philadelphia, didn't you? Tell us about that. Yes, I was a student at the Curtis Institute of Music for five years, and um, yeah, and Philadelphia is um, still my home. Wow, yeah. Well, I know you um, um, You also like the pizzas around there, because I remember going to one place <laughs> and sharing a fabulous yeah, pizza. Very, very nice pizza place just right across the street that I have to stay away from if, you know, if I, if I want to fit into my concert clothes, but it is, you know, it is pretty amazing pizza. Now, on occasion, diet becomes very important to you, doesn't it? Because you have this, this amazing uh, experience you put out there for, for music lovers called a Beethoven Sonata Thon. And how do, you, how do you prepare for that? Well, speaking of, well, pizza is definitely um, out of the question um, for, uh, for those preparation, as well as bread or soba noodles. You know, those, those, uh, that, you know that's my weakness. But six months before the Sonata Thon is a very, very strict... Um, preparation with lots of exercise, cardio, weightlifting, as well as um, um, strict proteins um, and vegetables for the whole time. Coffee, uh, no, no, no tea with milk, lots of water. And um, while I'm shocking the muscles at the gym, I'm also shocking my um, finger muscles. So I learn, all, uh, well not learn, uh, go through the sonatas uh, meticulously so that I have it in, I, I have them all in my head and I could just um, dictate, all right, Stuart, now, Opus 111, boom, Wolstein, now, so that um, there, there is no preparation. I could um, just read at a moment's notice, um, play whatever sonata without thinking about it. And um, that's part of the exercise too, so that, um, you know, my, uh, if there's any chance of my brain wandering, which thankfully ha hardly happens, my fingers are already on it. Right, right. And do you play them in? Um, now they weren't they weren't composed in numbered order, uh, composed out of out of uh, sequence, as it were. Um, mm. Do you play them in numbered order, or do you do you uh, rearrange them according to mood or anything? What, what do you do? Well, I rearrange them in terms of, uh, you know, uh, chronological order, you know, what was written first. So the Opus 49 sonatinas um, that are listed as sonata number 13 and I think eight, 18 or 19. I know the Opus numbers more than I know um, right. the other numbers, but the Opus... Well, the good thing is you know the music, Stuart. I know that. <laughs> exactly. So Opus 49, um, they were written earlier than Opus 2. So I begin with the Opus 49. And then from there, Opus 2 to 111. 
chronological order to the very end. Wow, wow. And this whole memory thing, I can attest to how phenomenal your, your memory appears to be, because there was one occasion that sticks with me and will stick with me forever, and everybody else who was in the room at the time. But when we were recording all of the Beethoven concertos with the BBC in Cardiff, um, there were occasions, um, and one in particular, when the producer, Andrew Keener, came over the loudspeaker and said, OK, we need to go from, from measure 352. And we're all scratching. And I turned to you. And you had no music there. And you just went, OK, yeah, I'm ready. I'm <laughs> yeah. ready. And I just looked at the orchestra. And, what, what is this guy? How can he do it? So that's quite incredible. So you play the piano fabulously well. You do something else as well that's very musical, don't you? I compose. Um, I've been a composer since I was eight years old. Uh, my first compositions were choral music. I attended a choir school in um, Toronto, did some piano music, but I always wanted to um, do orchestral music because a lot of um, the music that I adored were symphonies, um, uh, operas. So I was um, studying um, orchestration, um, devouring as many scores as I could. Um, started with uh, Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf, then, then the Mozart symphonies, then the Beethoven symphonies, and on to uh, um, uh, Ravel's orchestral works and just trying to learn as much as I could about um, timber, about uh, different sound worlds and um, you know everything. Wow, and, and you spend, uh, um a certain percentage of your time composing as opposed um, to playing, or yeah. do you get overwhelmed by it? Or? Uh, I keep very strange hours. So, um, you know, I, I, I nap, I compose, I practice, I nap, I compose. And, um, you know, when, whenever I'm, I'm getting ideas, um, I have manuscript paper if I'm walking, if I'm, if I'm traveling somewhere. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing both. And um, yeah. <laughs> so composing, playing the piano. Do you have any other interests? Do you have any time to do anything else? Um, I am very, uh, in my next life, um, I, I think I would immerse myself in music, but I would love to be a film director. I'm always fascinated by film and um, the way they tell a story uh, by using um, the media of you know, of cameras, of angles, mm -hmm. um, the actors um, that are casted, how um, to create their own masterpiece. So um, I've been fascinated by film since I was um, a teenager and was reading a lot about um, how David Lean directed um, The Bridge of, of the River Cry or um, Lawrence of Arabia, Igmar Bergman, Martin Scorsese, Tarantino, um, all of these very different directors and how they um, establish their own voice as well as moving every moviegoer. I can see the movie now and it's um, it's just called Stuart Goodyear and it's the life of a concert pianist and all the soundtrack is composed by Stuart Goodyear, directed by Stuart <laughs> Goodyear and it wins the Oscar for best Stuart Goodyear movie of the year. I, I, I love this. <laughs> now, now, now that's a vanity project. <laughs> <laughs> now, Stuart, when you come to Reading, uh, 17th of April it is, folks. When Stuart's in Reading, he's going to be playing Beethoven's fourth piano concerto, um, a, a, an overwhelmingly sublime piece of music right from the very opening bars. Um, and it's one of those, those pieces that... Uh, I call it sublime. That's a, it's it's almost fatuous to say that, but it, it creates an atmosphere. I think like like no other piece of music. How how do you approach it? Is there is there a particular uh, ambience you're trying to create? Oh boy, it's just. Um, I think it combines the world of um, uh, to me the the sonatas are Beethoven's personal diary and um, the concertos was a very public embracing music and the way that he um, combines both intimacy and um, and embracing the public. It's like um, Beethoven is letting the listener in and talking to them very, very closely before we are all taken on this journey and it just becomes a huge experience. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine the first time that was heard in public? That piece—they're—they're they're all waiting for some 
big opening orchestral tutti, some big crash bang, whatever. And it's just the piano with those incredibly soft G major chords. Yes. And people are probably sitting there, a very well musically educated audience, they're probably sitting there going, he's really lost it this time, this guy. <laughs> you know, we know he's got issues, but what is going on? That, that, um, that concert in 1808, I'm just thinking to myself, there must have been, you know, I, I envy the listeners and I don't envy the listeners because I keep on hearing um, about how cold that place is. And, you know, people, uh, people joke, you know, you're from Canada, but yeah, I said, yeah, but I'm half Trinidadian too. I love the heat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, very, you know, dead of winter in December and um, listening to, um, you know, that are now masterpieces that have been heard over and over and over again, but, you know, the, the premiere of the fifth symphony, the premiere of the pastoral symphony, the, um, the introduction to that incredible fourth concerto. Um, yeah, I could, I could only imagine. And other works as well. Could you imagine that as a concert yeah. in itself? So are, are already uh, Beethoven was thinking, uh, people were thinking Beethoven is out of his mind to, <laughs> to yeah. just, you know, just because of that program, but that must have been a heck of an evening. I think he was actually uh, living above the shop at that time as well. I think he had an apartment right. in the theater. And okay. it was one of the only, uh, I think, two occasions in his life when there were, there were benefit concerts for him, which was not an unusual event for composers in those no. days. So he's probably trying to get everything. Well, if they don't like this one, they might like this one. They, they, we'll, I, we'll do a sample of this. It's like a whole, you know, all different faces of Beethoven all in that one night. Yeah, yeah. Well, Stuart, you know, I can't wait to be on stage with you again. It's always a phenomenal experience. I can't wait to introduce you to the orchestra, the Reading Symphony Orchestra, and the audience in Reading as well. They're, they're lovely folks. They're going to love you. And let me just remind everybody again, it's on Saturday the 17th. Yeah, Saturday the 17th of April. And I'm not going to just say it's at 7.30 p.m. because there's also going to be a matinee performance at 4 p.m. So it's 4 p.m., 7.30 p.m. with an audience. So you can actually get tickets for this concert. If you don't want to go, you're not ready to go into a concert hall yet, it will be streamed live at 7.30 p.m. on YouTube. All you need to do is go to YouTube and put in Reading Symphony Orchestra. So you have plenty of opportunities to come and hear the wonderful Stuart Goodyear on the 17th of April. Stuart, thanks so much, and Thank I'll see you. you soon. Absolutely. Take care. Take care.